a brief of the Ten Commandments. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Jogler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today we have Sunday, the 22nd of October 2017, and I finally can start reading the wonderful last work that Martin Luther ever wrote in his life, Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil, a book that has been published on the same day as the Council of Trent, the damnable Counter-Reformation Council of Trent started against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil and um, before I even start reading this I want to tell you that my very dear brother in Christ Tom Fress also started reading this book last week on First Amendment Radio and um, I will give you the link of the playlist here and uh, at least the picture of it here and probably the link in the, uh, is in the video description box also that you can have a look at the playlist on First Amendment Radio and so you can choose if you whether want to listen to my reading and discussion of this book or you want to listen to Tom's reading and discussion of the book or you even want to do both. One thing is for sure, I do not listen to Tom's reading right now because I don't want to get influenced by what he does. I do my own stuff and I do my own explanation and comments and Tom does his work. I am no parrot of Tom Fress, but I told him months ago to start and, and go read this book because I was quite sure that he would absolutely love it. And, uh, well, he had under other things on his agenda, and as it turns out, we are now both almost simultaneously reading the book. But, of course, his will be uploaded before mine, because I don't have um, not the possibility to upload every day a new video, because then I do not have enough viewers for the videos, and I want everybody to give a chance, so I leave videos on my channel for two or three days, and Tom does five readings a week, and um, so... His book will be done earlier than probably mine, but uh, it's no contest. It's for me just a yeah, little advice that you can go to his reading also and that you can follow Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, follow the reading of Martin Luther's last work against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil. And after all the seven videos I produced already as, uh, as the introduction to this video I can now start right away because you know what it's all about. So we start in the book that is called Luther's Works Volume 41 Church and Ministry Part 3 American Edition printed in 1966. What a coincidence the same book the same year that I was born. <laughs> and uh, you know this book contains also um, other works of Luther uh, it contains on the Council and the Churches that he wrote in 1539. It contains against Hans Wurst, which he wrote in 1541. And finally, it contains against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil that he wrote in 1545. The Most Hellish Father, St. Paul III, in his supposed capacity as the Bishop of the Roman Church, has written two briefs to Charles V, our Lord Emperor, wherein he appears almost furious growling and boasting, according to the example of his predecessors, that neither an emperor nor anyone else has the right to convoke a council, even a national one, except solely the Pope. He alone has the power to institute, ordain and create everything which is to be believed and done in the Church. Now let me let me stop here right at the end of this very first sentence. The most hellish father. 
What is the official address? A Roman Catholic or anybody else who wants to address the Pope has to say, Most Holy Father, right? Martin Luther starts right away, Most Hellish Father. The tone for the book is set. The tone for the book that is called against the Roman papacy, against the most hellish father, an institution of the devil. Because we can read in Revelation 13 that the dragon gave him his power, right? The tone is set within the very first sentence. I love the way Luther wrote this book. He has also issued a papal bull, if one may speak like that, for about the fifth time. Now the council is once again to take place in Trent, but with the condition that no one attend except his own scum, the Epicureans and those agreeable to him, whereupon I felt a great desire to reply with God's grace and aid. Amen. Now, he speaks about Epicureans, and um, when I read the German version of the book, I didn't know that, work, uh, I, that word, I didn't know what it meant. I don't know if you are familiar with the word Epicureans, but Epicureans means godless people. Continue. First, he says, I beg you for God's sake, whoever you are, a Christian indeed, even if you still have natural reason, Tell me whether you can understand or comprehend what kind of a council that would be, or whether it could be a council. If that abominable abomination in Rome who calls himself Pope has such reservation, power and authority to tear up, change and ruin everything that is decided in the council as most of his decrees bellow. Doesn't it seem to you, my dear brother in Christ, or my dear natural reason, friend, that such a council would have to be nothing but a farce, a carnival act, put on to amuse the Pope? I have to agree here, because if only the Pope can convene a council, and only the Pope can say who is to attend the council, and what is being discussed at the council... Why do, we why do we hold a council in the first place? The same question Luther asked already in the, brief, in the letter to the Christian nobility in 1520, which you can follow on my, uh, on my um, Hour of the Truth series. You find that in the archives, two or three broadcasts I did on that. And there he asked the same questions. It's about the three walls the papacy built around him. And here again he asks the questions. Doesn't it seem to you, my dear brother in Christ, or my dear natural reason friend, that such a council would have to be nothing but a farce, a carnival act put on to amuse the Pope? What is the use of spending such great pains and effort on a council if the Pope has decided beforehand that anything done in the council should be subjected to him, the most hellish father, that nothing should be done unless it pleased him very much, and that he wants the power to condemn everything. To avoid all this trouble would be better to say, quote, Most hellish father, since it makes no difference at all what is or will be decided before or in or after the council, we would rather, without any council, believe in and worship your hellishness. Just tell us beforehand what we must do, unquote. Good teacher, what shall I do? As we can read in, read in Mark 10, verse 17. Then we shall sing the glad hymn to your hellishness, virgin, before, in and after childbearing, since you are the pure Virgin Mary who has not sinned and cannot sin for evermore. If not, then tell us, for God's sake, what need or use there is in councils, since your hellishness has such great power over them that they are to be nothing if it does not please your hellishness. Or prove us to poor, obedient, simple Christians and this is an expression Martin Luther uses in German, he says, Bon Christian, 
Bon Christian, which is an Italian term used by papal courtesans to describe the uneducated, common man, especially in Germany. And Luther probably became acquainted with this expression while his stay in Rome in 1510. So, prove to us poor, obedient, bon Christian, or simple Christians, whence your hellishness has such power. Where are the seals and letters from your superior that grant such things to you? Where is written evidence which will make us believe this? Won't your hellishness show us these things? Well then, we shall diligently search for them ourselves, and with God's help we shall certainly find them shortly. Meanwhile, we see and hear what a masterly conjurer the Pope is. He is like a magician who conjures golden into the mouth of silly people. Golden is the uh, currency frequently used in Europe at that time. He is like a magician who conjures golden into the mouth of silly people, but when they open their mouths, they have horse dirt in them. So this shameful fop, Paul III, Antichrist, Paul III, calls for a council now for the fifth time, so that anyone who hears the words must think he is serious. But before we can turn around, he has conjured horse dirt into our mouths, for he wants to have a council over which he can exercise his power, and whose decisions he could trample on. The very devil himself would thank him for such a council, and no one but the miserable devil, together with his mother, his sister, and his whoring children, pope, cardinals, and the rest of his devilish scum in Rome, will get there. It is now the twenty-fourth year, since the first imperial diet was held at Worms, under Emperor Charles, at, with, at which I personally stood before the Emperor and the whole Empire. Little note here from me. You remember that uh, Luther was uh, ordered to go to the edict at, uh, to the uh, to the edict, diet at Worms and uh, to recant of his works, like of the 95 Theses. He nailed to the church door at Wittenberg, like the writing of uh, the to the German nobility, which I spoke before earlier, and the writing, um, among others, of uh, the Babylon cap captivity of the Babylonian captivity of the church. Also, a work that um, uh, my dear brother in Christ, Tom Fress, read before he started reading this book, and also that playlist will be. Uh, linked in the description box of this video. Yeah? So, he says, it is now the 24th year, because we are writing now in, 20, uh, in 1545, and it was in 1521 that uh, Martin Luther was ordered to appear before the Diet at Worms. It is now the 24th year since the first imperial diet was held at Worms under Emperor Charles, that's Charles V, at which I personally stood before the emperor and the whole empire. It was the common wish of all estates of the empire in this same diet that several great and intolerable abuses, which were there named and afterward pointed out to Pope Adrian at the Diet of Nuremberg, and printed a copy of which is still available, and uh, therefore we have to see that this, this is a reference to a combined Latin-German edition of the most significant records of the Diet of Nuremberg, which was held in 1522, printed by Pipus in 1523. It contains the gravamina, the grievances of the German nation against the curia of the holy, quote-unquote, holy Roman Catholic Church. The Gravamina was first presented at the Council of Constance in 1417, and thereafter was constantly referred to in German diets. Antichrist Pope Adrian VI, who uh, reigned 1522-23, had a brief sent to the Diet of Nuremberg, where Luther published with marginal notes in 1538. And, of course, then the book goes further in the footnote, to give you the references and the sources where this is taken from. 
and um, this is another comment that I still have to make in, this, in the reading of this book, that you understand me correctly. This book is, in the English version, much better than in the German version, because this is really um, giving you all the sources where the things that Luther mentions come from, like what I just read right now. This is not stated in the German version. So the English-speaking people have a great advantage and they can see how wonderfully source-based this book is. There is no theory, there is no conspiracy theory ever mentioned in this writing of Martin Luther. It is all sourced, whether in the Bible or in history. And the sources are given in this book. Yeah? So, we are going to read this little sentence again. It was the common wish of all estates of the empire in this time, uh, in, in this same diet, that several great and intolerable abuses, which were there named and afterward appointed out to Antichrist Pope Adrian at the Diet of Nuremberg and printed, a copy of which is still available, that I just told you what that is, should be eliminated by the Pope and clergy, or the estates would do it themselves. Moreover, it was desired that his imperial majesty should ask the Pope to call for and hold a general free Christian council in Germany, or set up a national council, which the good emperor has until now done diligently, but he has been unable to accomplish anything with the popes. This is why the three words, free, Christian, council, have remained on everyone's lips in the German lands. These three words, free, Christian, German, are to the Pope and the Roman court nothing but sheer poison, death, devil and hell. He cannot stand them nor see or hear them. That is the way it is. It is certainly that he would rather let himself be torn to pieces and would rather become Turkish or devilish or whatever else would help him. Now, when Martin Luther here speaks of that the Pope would rather become Turkish, then he speaks of Islam. In that time, Islam by Martin Luther was addressed as Turkish. It was the Turk who stood at the doors. It was the Turk in the beginning of the 16th century who stood at the walls of Vienna and trying to conquer um, Rome, if you may understand it that way. Yeah? So when we are speaking here about the Turks, we are speaking about Muslims. We are speaking about the Islamic faith. Okay? This is the reason. In the year 1415, a council was held in Constance, Germany, wherein John Huss and Jerome were martyred. Jerome of Prague, a friend and disciple of John Huss, was executed in 1416, while the Council of Constance was in session. That was from November 5, 1414 to April 22, 1418. Hass was martyred in 1415. Hass was promised a safe trip to the Council of Constance and protection there and on the way back, but the Pope broke his promise and Hass was martyred. Now we just read that this Council of Constance was in session from November 5th, 1414. Here we have an interesting date. You remember the gunpowder plot? The 5th of November, a day never to be forgot. This Council of Constance was a farce for the Roman Catholic Church. It was a disaster for them, because three popes were <laughs> disposed of at that time, and the fourth elected. And we're going to read that a little bit later on in this book. But the date of November 5th, is interestingly chosen when you think, of course, of the gunpowder plot some 200 years later, 1605. 
John Huss and Jerome were martyred. Three popes were deposed. John the twenty third was deposed on May twenty ninth. I told you we are gonna read about this. John the twenty third, by the way, is one of the quote unquote popes that are not officially recognized even by the Roman Catholic Church, because you remember there was a John the twenty third during the time of the um, Second Vatican uh, Council, Vatican II, in the nineteen sixties. How can two popes bear the same name, John the Twenty Third? Well, because this very first John the Twenty Third was kind of a schism pope. He was deposed on May twenty fifth, fourteen fifteen. Gregory the Seventh abdicated on July fourth, fourteen fifteen, and Benedict the Eighth deposed on July twenty sixth, fourteen sixteen claimed the papal throne until his death in 1424. For the records of the council, and there, is, uh, and there you can read that, and there you will understand this history of, uh, of the Council of Constance. Three popes were deposed of, John the Twenty-Third, Gregory the Twelfth, and Benedict, uh, Benedict the Thirteenth. What, what did I read? Seventh and eighth, probably, yeah? No, no. It's John the Twenty-Third, Gregory the Twelfth, and Benedict the Thirteenth. All were disposed during the Council of Constance. Okay, a little bit more history lesson here. Three popes were deposed, and a fourth, Martin the Fifth, was elected. He reigned between 1417 and 1431. But the worst and most abominable item, which so horrifies the Pope is the one decided and established there at a council is that a council is superior to the Pope, not the Pope to the council. Also, that a council has the power to judge, sentence, punish, elect or depose the Pope, and not the contrary, that the Pope could judge, sentence or change the council. Ow! Ouch! Oh! That little item hurts them. That sting sticks deep in their heart. That stone nearly flattens their heart. This time they got burnt. They won't come back for more. They would rather let the whole world bathe and drown in blood, as Pope Eugene did when he brought about great murder and bloodshed through the French Dauphin at Strasbourg so that he could break up the Council of Basel, which had started according to the example in order of the Council of Constance, and had already chosen a Pope, Amadeus, Count of Savoy, called Felix V, where we read in a footnote that Eugene IV, who ruled between 1431 and 1447, was compelled to convoke the Council of Basel between 1431 and 1449, but disagreed with its decisions. When the council elected Felix V, who ruled between 1439 and 1449, Eugene IV managed to remain in power, supported by Emperor Frederick III, who reigned between 1440 and 1493. The, quote, great murder and bloodshed at Strasbourg, unquote, however, had nothing to do with Eugene IV. It was caused by Louis XI, called Dauphin, as the eldest son of King Charles VII of France, who assisted Frederick III in the war against the Swiss between 1443 and 1450. His mercenaries plundered Strasbourg on the way to Basel in the summer of 1444. But if there was to be peace, this same Pope, Felix V, had to abdicate at the council for, and the council fall, for they cannot and will not again risk the terrible experience they suffered at Constance. Now the council of Constance, was un, uh, which was unholy enough, nevertheless had great and inescapable needs and compelling reasons to establish and resolve that a council must be above the Pope and not the Pope above a council. For there were three popes, not one, of whom wished to yield to the others. Thus, there was great disorder, and chaos reigned in the whole Roman Church, as one pope banned the other, one took the other's endowments, and 
prebends, for each wanted to be the sole pope over everything. No good could come from this. The confusion lasted for about 39 years. Yeah, you know, this papal schism that I briefly mentioned already a few minutes ago, that lasted from 1378 until 1417, when the Council of Constance elected Martin V. So, this confusion lasted about 39 years. This confusion is a schism within the Roman Catholic Church. So that the whole world cried and begged for a council in order to have a single pope again. For at that time, men were of the opinion that Christendom could not exist without a pope. Thereupon the five nations of Germany, Italy, France, England and Spain joined to help bring about a council at Constance, which the Emperor Sigismund convened after great effort. Now, Emperor Sigismund was the Holy Roman Empire in the time between 1410 and 1437. Now, if the council were to, dispo were to depose the popes, it had to reach an agreement beforehand and resolve at a, that the council is to be above the Pope and has the power and right to depose him, for papal law prohibits an inferior to depose a superior. Ah, yeah. <laughs> All power is from top down. All power in the Roman Catholic Antichrist world is from the top down. That's why you have no grassroots movement. That's why you have no grassroots government in this system that we live in. Papal law, Roman Catholic canon law, prohibits an inferior to depose a superior. So that means even if the inferior sees and feels that the superior is wicked, he cannot depose of him. Roman Catholic canon law prohibits an inferior to depose a superior. The Pope can be a sinner as bad as he is, he can be a pedophile, he can be a sodomite, he still is superior and cannot be deposed of by an inferior. That's Roman Catholic canon law. Oh, people are afraid of Sharia law. You have no idea what Roman Catholic canon law is. Papal law prohibits an inferior to depose a superior. So, how can the quote-unquote most superior person in the world... <laughs> which the Pope claims he is, be disposed, deposed of? Good question, eh? Thus, their great need compelled them, as one had to depose at least two Popes, whereas the third would remain, to decide beforehand that they had the power and the right to depose the Popes. So it was then and there decided that the Pope was under the Council, and not above the council, despite the fact that for so many centuries beforehand the Pope had cried himself hoarse and bellowed until he nearly died through all his decrees and decretals that said he was above all councils, he was above all the world, even above all the angels in heaven. That is, he was God's vicar on earth and an earthly God and so many other abominable things that are terrible for a Christian heart and ears to hear. What I forgot to tell you about what I'm reading right now, this begin pages of the book Against the Papacy and Roman Institution of the Devil, um, is that the first 27 pages we will spend with a kind of an introductory. And after that, Martin Luther will attack three points of the papacy. One of the points is that the Pope says that he is God's vicar on earth and that he 
is above all councils, all world, and even above the angels. That's the first point that Martin Luther will address. That takes us about 50, year, 50 pages in the German book, and it's a good part of this English book also. We will read that later on. But it is very profound that we understand what I read to you here right now, that the Pope says he was above all councils, above all the world, even above all the angels in heaven. That is, he is God's vicar on earth, Vicarius Fili Dei. That's the title the Pope wears. That's what is written in Daniel, that he exalts, and, uh, uh, exalts himself above everything that is called God. Right? And in Second Thessalonians, he sits in the temple of God, pretending to be God. That's exactly what the Pope is. That's exactly what the Bible warns us of. So do we need to further read this book against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil to understand that the Pope is, the papacy is the Antichrist? No, we just have to read the Bible. But because many people do not read the Bible in the first place and in the second place are too lazy to do their own studies, I'll gladly do this reading and tell you that the Pope says he is God's vicar on earth, he is above all councils, he is above all the world, even above all the angels in heaven. Martin Luther, in this book, and me reading this book, will prove to you biblically, historically, and prophetically that this is the Antichrist of the Bible. You do not need to look for a future one. You do not need to look for a seven-year tribulation and a secret rapture, because that's not in the Bible. And this reading of this book will make that absolutely clear. You have to understand that this reading is a protestant reading. I protest the Antichrist with every fiber of my body. That's what protestantism is all about. Protest the Antichrist who drove out thousands and thousands of people of Europe to come to the quote-unquote New World America. First of all, Puritans, Huguenots, people who were persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church at that time and then settled down in what was then called the 13 colonies of the New World. Because there they could, for the very first time, live out real religious freedom. The freedom to worship the God of the Bible in the way that he ordained it to them. Something they couldn't do in the persecuted old world, in the persecuted terrain of the Antichrist, as it is described in Revelation 13. Tongues, multitudes, nations were the first beasts arose of. This book is a protest from the very first to the very last letter, from the very first to the very last reading. If you don't like it, then go elsewhere. Here you hear the unbridled truth. Now, continuing in the book. Thereupon one pope named Gregory, abdicated voluntarily and handed his papacy over to the council, albeit in the hope that the council would appreciate his ready humility and re-elect him pope. <laughs> Since this did not happen, he died of great regret and sorrow. He remained a cardinal and died in 1417. The second pope, named John, which was the earlier mentioned John the Twenty Third, was with great difficulty persuaded to go to Constance to the council in the same and much greater hope that he would remain the only pope because he had sat on the Roman throne. The third, Benedict the Thirteenth, remained stiff-necked in his position and was justly and forcefully deposed according to the law and statute of the council. This is the horrible item that has until now so annoyed the Pope. And this is why they will not and cannot tolerate a council among the beasts in Germany. 
They fear that the example of the Council of Constance may be used against them, and that perhaps Antichrist Paul III would ride into Trent as Pope, but ride out again as a poor fool. <laughs> he rides in as a poor fool also, because the Pope is a poor fool. That's my opinion. So it is to his interest, and according to their plan, to stay in Rome without councils and above councils, even if the world should come to an end. For the histories tell of sorry, for the histories tell of when one Pope John visited Germany, there someone began to examine his life and administration. Up to then, no one had dared to speak up against him as Pope, and it was found that about forty articles were proved against him, all of them worthy of death. Thereupon he fled and tried to get back to Rome, but Emperor Sigismund caught him on the way, and he was placed in the custody of the Count of Palatinate. When he was rebuked with the articles, he answered each one with, Quote, oh, I have done something much worse than that! Unquote. This reply amazed the delegates, for, among other, other articles, it was written he had strangled his father. He had practiced black magic. He had practiced simony and many more scandalous vices. How could he have done worse things than that? He answered that the worst thing he had ever done was to have allowed himself to be persuaded to cross the Italian mountains from Rome into Germany. By this he meant that if he had stayed in Rome and kept the papacy, he would have been free of such accusations, and would have remained the most holy father pope, even if he had done a thousand times as much evil. <laughs> so... The office of the papacy protects from being a murderer, practicing magic, practicing simony and more scandalous vices. The office of the papacy protects. And there are two very current examples where we can mirror that on. The first is Antichrist Pope Benedict XVI who was the head of the Congregation of the Faith, which the Inquisition called now for 25 years before he took the papal chair in 2000 and something, after John Paul II died, was 2008 or whatever. He was on the verge of being persecuted for his pedophilia. And the current Pope at this moment, Pope Francis, who has been persecuted for his role in the dirty war in Argentina during the late 70s, begin uh, 80s of last century. And because he was going to be accused of that, he fled and took the papal chair. So what Martin Luther writes here about 500 years ago has been the story of the papacy all along. And this is the Vicar of Christ? Yeah, my behind. Now the popes have learned a lesson from this, Council of Constance, of course, and take the greatest care not to commit such great folly and sin as to travel across the mountains into Germany like that same Pope John had done. And who can blame them for it? <laughs> Out of great love and concern of for poor Christendom, the love, the papacy, and hate to abandon it, for the Pope is the head of all Christendom and Lord of the whole world. Moreover, an earthly divinity whom Christ made his vicar on earth to teach and save all souls. You will understand the rest very well if you just think, yes, devil and hellfire. According to that, just look at the writing of this fop, Paul III, Antichrist Paul III, who, not to forget, ordained the order of the Jesuits in 1540, 
and they were the ones founding the Council of Trent. This fop, Paul III, when he writes to the emperor, quote, Do you want a council? We shall grant it to you. You want it in Germany? See, we shall even dare to do this. But in such a way that it is a free and Christian council in which the heretics have no part, as they can have no part in the church. Moreover, you should order the arms withdrawn, that is, you should create safety and peace. You should also know that you have no right to judge who shall be ordered to the council, that is the prerogative of our temporal authority. I have to comment on this. You probably expect me to. Huh? <laughs> the Pope writes, Antichrist Pope Paul III writes to the Emperor Charles V, still the same emperor it was 24 years ago when Martin Luther appeared at the Edict at Worms, do you want a council? the Pope asks. We shall grant it to you. Do you want it in Germany? See, we shall even dare to do this. But, now comes but, in such a way that it is a quote-unquote free, meaning free by the definition of the Roman Catholic Church, meaning bound in the ears and eyes of a real Christian, and Christian council, read Catholic council, means Roman Catholic council, in which the heretics, means the Protestants, have no part, as they can have no part in the church. So, the Pope decrees here, you can get your quote-unquote free council, which is actually a bound council, because the Pope is above the council, not the council above the Pope. Second, you can have a Christian council, which is not a Christian council, but a Roman Catholic council. And you can also only have it if the heretics have no part. Because, and this is a question that we have to understand, Luther always wanted to have a council because he wanted to reform the Roman Catholic Church, a church that is irreformable because it is the synagogue of Satan. But still, he wanted to have a council to reform that church, and therefore he needed a platform to speak from, a platform for the Protestants to speak from. But the Pope does here in this letter to the Emperor write already that the heretics have no part of it. So, where is the communication between them two? Where is the quote-unquote reconciliation that could be put between the quote-unquote heretics and the Roman Catholic Church? There is none. From the beginning, this whole council is a farce, is a show, is an act, just as Luther, Luther said already. Because the Pope sets the terms of this council. And of course we today know the history of the Council of Trent. We know of more than 120 curses, anathemas that were spoken out against the Protestants. The Protestants, or as the Pope calls them here, the heretics, the real Bible-believing, to the Bible-adhering, Jesus Christ-loving Christians, did never have a chance. Not at the Council of Trent, not at the Council before, and never at the Council after. Well, you say, what about the Ecumenical Council of the 1960s? There the heretics had part of it, because there the Ecumenical Movement was set in. There was the time for reconciliation. Yeah, was it? Well, go back to my book reading, All Roads Lead to Rome, to understand that damnable council, Vatican Council II from the 1960s. The ecumenical movement is only there for to water down the Bible, to, water, to make compromises with the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church never compromises, but 
the, to compromise with the Roman Catholic Church through her various institutions like the World Council of Churches, like the ARK, uh, ARK we have in Germany or the Ecumenical uh, Council worldwide that you have to make compromises to go back under the wings of Rome. The quote-unquote heretics, the Protestants, the real Bible-believing Christians never got an open ear from the Roman Catholic Church. Satan does not want to, does not can listen to the Word of God. Because when you as a Bible-believing Christian hold the Bible up, Satan takes a run. He cannot stand the Word of God. He has nothing to do against it. Oh, he has everything to do against everything, but he has nothing to do against the Word of God, the Bible, the truth. You should also know that you have no right to judge who shall be ordered to the council. That's the prerogative of our temporal authority. So the Pope says here in the beginning that the Emperor cannot judge who shall be ordered to the council, meaning who can appear before the council, meaning how can there be quote-unquote reconciliation with Protestants, with quote-unquote heretics, if they are not even allowed at the council, when they are not allowed to speak. Yeah. And this is a prerogative of our temporal authority, says the Pope. Now, this temporal authority is something that we will attack in the very first point that Martin Luther goes into this book after this introduction that I'm reading right now. We are not even getting close. We are not even getting warm to what Martin Luther has for us, waiting for us in this book. But this little brief, this little letter that he writes to Charles V, the Emperor of Europe. Do you want a council? We shall grant it to you. Do you want it in Germany? <laughs> See? We shall even dare to do this. But in such a way that it is a quote-unquote free, means bond, that it is a quote-unquote Christian, means Roman Catholic Council, in which the heretics, the Protestants, have no part as they can have no part in the church. Moreover, you should order the arms withdrawn. That is, you should create safety and peace. You should also know that you have no right to judge who shall be ordered to the council. That is the prerogative of our temporal authority. There you see, Martin Luther continues, there you see now what kind of language the Pope, the Antichrist and his holy school of scoundrels in Rome have and how he teaches us to interpret the three words, free, Christian, German, namely, that he wishes to grant a council which he is certain can never be held, for he knows and senses quite well that he and his accursed school of scoundrels are far, far worse than Pope John did in Constance. The princes and the states of the empire have been working these 24 years through the emperor for a free Christian German council with the honest intention, with the honest intention according to the commonly accepted meaning of these words, devoid of all sophistry, namely that free in German and liberum in Latin mean tongues and ears should be free in the council, that everyone, especially those appointed by all sides to speak, listen and act, may freely say, complain or respond to whatever is pertinent to reform the church and abolish offenses and abuses. Did you get that? Everyone, especially those appointed by all sides to speak, listen and act, may freely say, complain or respond to whatever is pertinent to reform the church and abolish offenses and abuses. To reform the church, that's the idea of this council. And the Pope 
does not want a reformation of the synagogue of Satan. He cannot allow a reformation of the synagogue of Satan because that would mean an abolishment of the synagogue of Satan. This is how the Germans and imperial estates meant it, and still mean it, but particularly, and above all, that's, that God's word, the Holy Scripture should, free and without strings as it must be, have its way and its rights according to which one decides and judges everything. That is why there must be also be good theologians there, who have understanding of and experience in the scriptures. It means free, because the council is free, and the scriptures, that is, the Holy Spirit, are free. This is one of the greatest fears of the Antichrist, that the scripture the Holy Spirit within the scripture is free. That is why the Jesuits work since the day of foundation in 1450 on corrupting the Bibles. That the scripture may not be free. That the council here not be free. So we see what free means to Martin Luther. A free council and the scripture and the Holy Spirit are free to be in that council and to freely speak. That is what free means to a quote-unquote heretic. And that is, of course, what bound means to the Roman papacy. Martin Luther continues, But the Roman school of scoundrels and its schoolmaster twist and falsify the word so, that free should mean that he, the Pope, and his school of scoundrels are free. You see, what I commented on some minutes ago in the same reading, when I explained to you what free means, Martin Luther explains it now in the same way. But the Roman school of scoundrels and its schoolmaster twist and falsify the word so that, quote-unquote, free should mean that he and his school of scoundrels are free, that nothing shall be said, changed, or undertaken against them, but that absolutely everything, the way they now live and act, will be ratified, that therefore the Pope would be free against the council, not the council against the Pope. This is the Pope's old story, of all his decrees and decretals, Namely, he should be lord and judge over the council, not the council over the pope, so that the pope has the power to condemn, to tear up and veto anything the council resolved against him. Indeed, before undertaking something, they have to ask his grace, to see if it would please him, so that a council would be nothing but a yes-man who sits near at the washball at the door of the council chamber upstairs and listens to what the gracious lords at the high table propose. This is what the Pope calls a free council. Is there the possibility of a compromise between what Martin Luther calls a free council, because the council is free, the scriptures, that is the Holy Spirit, are free, and what the Pope calls a free council means that everybody has to listen up what the gracious lords at the high table propose? Is there a compromise between these two things even vaguely possible? I ask of you, and then take into consideration that the Roman Catholic Church, semper eadem, never changes, always the same. That was her standpoint in 15, or before 1540, before the Council of Trent. That was the standpoint before any other council that held before, and it was there, it or still is their uh, prerogative that they have today and in all the councils that came after Council of Trent. 
which were two. The First Vatican Council in 1870, where the Pope was declared infallible, and the Second Vatican Council of the 1960s with the ecumenical movement that quote-unquote brought an end to Protestantism. Because who are the protesters today? Where is protest of the Antichrist? Where, except for Inquisition update and my channel, do you see this open protest against the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist anywhere on YouTube? Show me. I'd love to see this, where you see that also. Watered down Gospels you have. Yeah, lots of them. And people who do not understand that the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy in Daniel 9 is completely fulfilled by our Lord Jesus Christ 2000 years ago. There are many of them. There are even some who say that the Pope is the Antichrist. But do they say it with the same vigor, with the same power that an Inquisition update does? I don't think so. Luther continues, this is the language of the sea in Rome. So that when he grants a free council, you may henceforth also understand it in Roman. When, we, when they say, quote-unquote, free, it means captive with us Germans. When they say white, you must understand black. <laughs> this is from Martin Luther in 1545, people. And this is taken right out of the oath of the Jesuits, that when the Roman Catholic hierarchy tells you black is white and white is black, that's the way you have to see it, because the end justifies the means. When they say free, it means captive with us Germans. When they say white, you must understand black. When they say the Christian church, you must understand the scum of all the scoundrels in Rome. When they call the emperor a son of the church, it is as much as to say he is the most accursed man on earth who they wish were in hell, so that they would have the empire. When they call Germany the praiseworthy nation, it means the beasts and barbarians who are not worthy to feed on the Pope's dung, like the Italian companies, as one says, did when he had been in Germany, not to his disadvantage, and, on returning to the Italian frontier, turned his back on Germany, squatted, burned his behind, and said, Aspice nudatas barbara terranates, Look here, you beasts! Look up my ass! That is the language that Luther speaks throughout this book. This is the language that you will get to accustomed to when you are going to follow reading me this book. Now, I'm going to close with a little footnote on the last little quote that I did here, Aspice nudatas barbera terra natis. Giantonio Campano, court poet, court poet of Antichrist Pope Pius II, who served between 1458 and 1464, the devil, known for his satirical report about the barbaric ignorance of Germans, he met during his stay at the Diet of Regensburg in 1471, wrote this, At nudatas, barbara terra natis. Look here, you beasts, look up my ass. Addressed to the Germans. Do you see what hatred the Pope has against Germans? Now, when you understand that, do you understand that why Germany was chosen to bring forth two quote-unquote world wars that were from the beginning stirred by the papacy. If you want to get a deeper understanding of that, then keep following my channel, because I have already read half of the book and worked it into videos of the secret history of the Jesuits, where you can learn in the latter part of the book reading a lot 
on the Jesuits' involvement in the First and Second World War, which were nothing else but inquisitional wars. But with this little quote that was written by the poet of the Pope, Giantonio Campagno, I will end this very first reading. A speech nudatas, Barbara Terra natas. Look here, you beasts. Look up my ass. Thank you very much for watching, listening, learning, commenting, and until next time, Jogna 66 from Hour of the Truth signing off says God bless you and bye bye. <laughs>